It's a pleasure to have Peter Isinski today from the Institute of Mathematics in Toulouse. And he'll tell us about quasi-isometric rigidity of the class of convex co-compact <coughs> Introduction. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. I have to admit that uh, when I was a PhD student, I, most of the time I spent in the library trying to make photocopies of the papers of Alphonse and Bers. So, that, <laughs> of course, the math department was not very happy because it cost a lot of. <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the talk. Uh, I want to give will concern uh, convex co-compact Kleinian groups. So let me remind you that Kleinian uh, group is uh, just a discrete subgroup G of PSL to C, and you can see it as acting on hyperbolic three space properly. by isometries. And also, you can see it as a conformal dynamical system acting on the Riemann sphere by Möbius transformation. Okay. Okay, so when you look at the action on the, on the Riemann sphere, it is not always properly discontinuous. Actually, it's never proper. Uh, most of the time, it's not. But you, you have a splitting of the of the sphere into two vision sets. So one which is the limit set, which can be defined as the set of accumulation points of uh, one orbit. And the other is the set of discontinuity. And so uh, as Poincaré had noticed, you can see the hyperbolic three space as the open unit ball in R3. And the Riemann sphere is, uh, can be seen as the, as the boundary of the free ball. Okay. And so then you get an action of your group on the closed ball. Right? And so uh, in this case, you see the limit set at infinity. Maybe I'll take colors since uh, you have the chance to have some. So usually it's a fractal set, which can be very complicated. Okay, and then, since the limit set is invariant by the action of the group, it's also the case for uh, its uh, uh, convex hull, right? So which I'm drawing roughly like this. And so then the group G is convex co-compact. If uh, the action on the convex hull is uh, is co compact. So if this is compact, right? And so uh, this class of groups is uh, very important, and I would like to give you two motivations uh, to to study such groups and why they are at least from my point of view, interesting. So first, as explained uh, Jeremy Kahn yesterday, it's tightly related to the topology of three manifolds. So since the action is uh, uh, properly discontinuous uh, on H3 and also on the set of discontinuity, what you can look at is at the orbit space of H3 and omega G over G, and then you get an orbifold, a so-called Kleinian orbifold. And when the group is torsion-free, then you get a manifold. Okay? And so in this setting, G will be convex co-compact. So I will write C2K for convex co-compact uh, Kleinian group. Okay? So G is convex co-compact if and only if. And G is compact. And so it follows from the work of Thurston and of Perlman that we have a complete characterization of those groups which appear, or th those manifolds which can be described as a quotient of the Kleinian group. Right? So the theorem, uh, so Thurston is for the Hacken case, and 
general man or the general man. So assume that you have M3 is a irreducible orientable compact uh, three manifold and that its uh, fundamental group is infinite and that you have no z squared embed into the fundamental group, then you can find a convex co-compact linear group G such that M is homeomorphic to MG. And another interesting fact, a property of a Kleinian groups is the way it acts on its limit set when it's uh, convex co-compact. So this is, this is called the notion of a uniform convergence action. So you have a group acting by, by uh, homeomorphism on a compact set. You say that it, the action is a, uni, uh, is a uniform convergence action if uh, the action on the set of distinct triples is properly discontinuous and co compact. Okay, so. It is a fact that uh, G, uh, a Kleinian group, G is convex or compact if and only if uh, the action is act. Uh, its action on lambda G is a uniform convergence. Okay. Uh, And so you see, we have two different settings in which these groups arise. And uh, the uh, basic question is to say, what, how can we characterize such groups uh, in general? Okay. I don't know. Oh. So uh, in the talk th this morning of uh, Kaswa Rafi, he explained to us that when you have a group which is finitely generated, then you can see it as a geometric object. And from the geometric point of view, what you obtain is that this geometry is not well defined. It's defined up to quasi-isometry. Okay, so maybe I should uh, recall what is a quickly a quasi-isometry. So a quasi-isometry will be a map phi between two metric spaces such so that you have two constants, lambda and C, for the following property. For each time you pick two points, phi x and phi y, if you look at its distance, then it is bounded by lambda d, the distance from x to y up to an additive constant. It is at least one over lambda minus C. And the other condition you want is that the image of x to y is almost subjective, meaning that. Uh, for any y in the image, uh, the distance from y to phi of x is bounded by c. Okay. And so uh, from the point of view of geometric group theory, each time you prove a property, usually it's defined up to quasi-isometry. So if you want to characterize Kleinian groups, then you get properties which will be true for Kleinian groups, but also for all the groups which are quasi-isometric to that group or to this class of groups. And so it is a natural question to try to understand how big is the quasi-isometry class of a convex or compact Kleinian group? How can we single out this, uh, this? And so it turns out, so I don't know if I can raise this now. <laughs> Otherwise, I can raise down here also. <laughs> but uh, it turns out that actually the, this class is as small as possible. And so this is the the main result of this talk. Okay. So let's say M is a foreign. So 
if G is quasi-isometric to a convex co-compact planar group K, then G contains a finite index subgroup uh, which is isomorphic to a convex co compact canyon group. Okay. And so uh, there were, of course, prior to this general statement, there were several cases which were already known. State. So when the limit set of K is a circle, then this is due to Cassandra Young Rice and Gabay. Okay. When uh, lambda K is the whole sphere, then this is due to Cannon and Cooper. And uh, more recently, when uh, lambda k is a Sierpinski carpet, this follows from work of uh, Bonk, Merenkov, uh, Bonk, Kleiner, and Merenkov. And there are also some easy cases which can be ruled out. Okay, so maybe uh, before I raise this, I forgot to comment on this definition. Where the, the set of distant triples comes from and why we have this property. For each time you pick three points uh, in the limit set or at infinity on the Riemann sphere. Can all, it always defines an ideal triangle, right? And because you're in hyperbolic geometry, you have a smallest, the largest disk which will be tangent to the three side. Okay, so each time you look at the action of three distinct points, it's as if you were looking at the action of a point in the middle. Right? And so the action is properly discontinuous on the set of triples, it just means that it is properly discontinuous in H3. Saying that it is co-compact, it means that uh, it is a convex co-compact. Right? So it's a natural way of trying to translate uh, the notion of uh, Convex co compactness without hyperbolic geometry, just by a dynamical uh, point of view. Okay. And, uh, okay. So, what I wanted to say uh, is that there are several cases that we could. Uh, I guess, uh, so. Okay, so. Easy cases where we can understand. So first, if, if the limit set is, is empty, then this means that uh, K is finite, okay? And this implies that G will be finite as well. And so in this case, you can just take the neutral element. It will be a trivial, uh, it will be a finite index subgroup which will act on hyperbolic three space concept, okay? So G contains. Not that interesting, but at least uh, it falls in this case. When lambda k has two elements, then in this case, uh, you know that G has to be virtually cyclic. And the same, you can take any loxodromic element that you want, and it will be solved. And there is a harder case is when lambda k is a counter set. So it follows from work of uh, and Woody, I guess, and Stellings, that uh, G is uh, virtually free. And here, too, you have many examples of uh, convex co compact planning groups, which are free. Okay, so from now on, I, I want to focus on the cases when lambda k is uh, connected. It's connected. 
So of course, uh, it's not exactly the complement set, but it's a uh, I should maybe first explain how do we translate the information of being quasi-isometric to a convex or compact uh, Kleinian group, how the assumption is used. Okay, so. Uh, So the general theory tells you actually that G will be word hyperbolic, and then it will, its boundary will be homeomorphic to the limit set of K. But in other words, what's important for us is that G will act on lambda K as a uniform convergence group. And the action will also be uniformly quasi modulus Okay, so then, of being uh, quasi-isometric to a uh, convex to compact Lenin group. And so what you get is not only the fact that the group is word hyperbolic, but you have the same conformal structure at infinity. And this means that this uh, action is uniformly quasi -metrics. So as you know, uh, Mobius maps preserve uh, cross ratios, so here, we, won't, we are not looking at the standard cross ratio on the Riemann sphere, but at a metric cross ratio, which is essentially the same by taking distances instead of, uh, of differences. So I look, if I take two po four points A, B, C, D, I look at the distance from A to B times the distance from C to D, divided by the distance from A to C times the distance from B to D. And so a Möbius map will preserve uh, cross ratios. Here we want something, we have something which is slightly weaker but still uniform. So this thing that we have uh, a homeomorphism, a distortion function okay, such so that, so this is a homeomorphism. So that each time you pick four points A, B, C, D in the limit set of K, each time you pick an element G in your group and you see how it acts on this thing, then the image, the cross ratio of the image of the, your four points is controlled by the cross ratio of your four points. Okay? And so just note that if I exchange the rule of B and T, what I do is I have the inverse cross ratio. So this is actually a double inequality. So I have control of the cross ratios on both sides. So this is some sort of bounded distortion for the dynamics. Okay, and so then you can think that we're almost done because there is a theorem concerning uniform actions of uh, quasi mobius maps on the Riemann sphere, right? That I would like to recall right now. So that if G is a countable group, acting on the Riemann sphere by uniform quasi mobius maps, then G is quasi mobiusly conjugate to a subgroup uh, M of the Mobius. So it is conjugate to a group of Möbius transformation. Okay. So here, I guess you cannot read uh, now because of the, the screen. And so, so. so this means that in the case of Cannon and Cooper, if the limit set is the whole sphere, then you get a global action, and you can apply the theorem to get a convex co-compact Cannon. Okay. Actually, it will be co-compact in this case. So it's already done. But of course, usually, you don't have such an action. The limit set is a one-dimensional subset. So let me mention also 
for the case of the circle, there's a theorem of uh, Hinkanen and uh, Markovich. So Hinkanen proved one case and Markovich uh, the, the missing cases. So if in the case that lambda k is the uni unit circle, then you have the same conclusion as in Sullivan's theorem, namely that uh, uh, the action of S1 is uh, G S1 is quasi mobiously conjugate to the action of Mobius uh, uh, group. And so also this, in this case, it's a way of setting. And so here we get more information actually than uh, the fact that you have a convergence group and it is conjugate to the Christian group. And I, I will need this uh, later on. And so in the case also of uh, the Sierpinski carpet, so if you know that uh, lambda k is a round carpet, meaning that uh, the complement of, uh, of your compact set is uh, our round disks, then what uh, Bonkleiner and Merenkov prove is that actually the group is already a subgroup of the Möbius transformation of the, of the Riemann sphere automatically. So then there's nothing to do. And so this uh, is equivalent to saying that K will be the fundamental group of a um, hyperbolic manifold with a geodesic boundary. So even if, uh, to start with, the carpet is not round, you can always deform it to get it with uh, such properties. Okay. So now, what I would like to try to explain is uh, how can we deal with the other cases? So first, I would like to, so here uh, it's a very nice um, theorem, but it's a little cheating because nothing was needed to be done. The group was already a group of Möbius transformation. So I would like to explain how we can make a different approach for this case. <coughs> and so uh, the, the assumption that I want to use, and it will be, it will enable me to generalize the theorem to a broader setting is the fact that the action is uh, assumed to have a, what I want to call a planar action. Meaning, a priori, your, your group is just acting on a compact set, a one-dimensional compact set. So you don't know exactly how, it, how even to extend the dynamics to the whole sphere. It's not even clear that there are restrictions of homeomorphism of the whole sphere. So, but in the case of carpets, it's always, always the case because uh, since the, the boundary components are non-separating, the image is also a non-separating uh, Jordan curve. And then it has to, to map uh, connected components of the complement to connected components of the complement. So that's the assumption I would like to make. So for any omega connected component of the complement of the limit set, for any element of the group G, there is another connected complement of the complement such that the boundary of omega is mapped to the boundary of omega prime. Okay. So this means that I have an action on k, on the limit set of k, and also an action on the connected complements of the properly discontinuous set. And under this assumption, so it's a basic set, uh, what we can prove is that uh, the group G the action of G is conjugate to the action of a convex or compact linear group. Okay, so there are several ingredients. So the basic idea is how to, can we extend the dynamics? And this is where the work of uh, Hinkanen and Markovich gets into the picture. Because, for instance, I will just look, I just want to give a brief idea. It's not even a sketch, it's some sort of hint why this should hold. So you, you have your com component, omega. 
So what you want to prove is that you can map it to the unit circle, and then you'll have an action on the unit circle. If you just look at the stabilizer, for instance, of this component. And then you know that here you will get, a, because you conjugate this, if you can do it by a quasi-Mobius map, then you get a uniformly quasi-Mobius action on the unit circle. So then by the theorem of Inkanen and Markovich, you know that it, ex, it is conjugate to a Mobius group, so it has an, uh, an extension to the whole disk. So then you don't have any choice of how defining this extension. And this means that here you have a natural extension to the, of the stabilizer to the whole thing. And this is the basic idea of how, why it, it can be worked like that. So there are several assumptions to check. First, that this is a quasi-disk, but this is true because I'm starting with a convex or compact Riemann group. So the, the set of components of the limit set of K are uniform quasi-disks. And in this setting uh, of a group acting uniformly, uh, uniform quasi-mobius action uh, with a uniform convergence, uh, what, what am I saying? Uh, I mean, you start with a group which are acting uniformly quasi, uh, by uniform quasi-mobius maps and also which is a uniform convergence group. In, in this case, you also have some a version of the Alphonse Fanetes theory, meaning that you have um, finitely many orbits of the set of discontinuity and the stabi stabilizers of any connected component is uh, conjugated to a co-compact Fuchsian group. So working a little more, what you can do is extend the dynamics inside all the omega limit set to have uh, something which will be uniformly quasi-mobius on the uh, omega limit set and also on the limit set. But then you have to check that the, you blew, when you blew both maps, they are remain also quasi-mobius, right? To be able to apply the theorem there. And this is true, it, it, it can, a way of doing that is using uh, Gehring's uh, definition of quasi-conformal mappings saying that you look at very small, uh, you look at the distortion of very small disks, how they, they act when you take the image and you can control the shape here and prove that it is quasi-conformal, even globally when you take points on the boundary of the image. Okay, so this is a very rough idea of how this can be worked out when you have a panel action. So here there's a lot of analysis and you have to understand the geometry of the limit set and then, it's complement to go through that. But now in general, of course, the action need not be a planner. So let me, ah, sorry, I erase it. Let me try to explain some things which can happen. So essentially, you can have two points on the limit set which will disconnect disconnected. So for instance, uh, you will have some sort of uh, red component, Mr. Red here. You have a Mr. Yellow and uh, Mr. White. Okay, and then you look at your group action because when you take off these two, these two points, it is disconnected. Then uh, G need not respect the way it is mapped. So for instance, uh, if Mr. Red uh, got sunburned, then he might want to flip on the other side. So he would be much something like that. Um, Mr. Yellow wants to get protected, so he'll go below. And uh, Mr. White will remain where it was. So here you see there are two kind of obstructions that you can get from having a planner action. One is that you can flip the components one by one it need not extend to a global map. And also you can change the cyclic order at the, at the point. Okay. So essentially there's no hope that you can try to figure out how to get the right action and the right embedding and stuff like that. So you have, we have to use other tools for that. So it turns out that uh, these local cut points are well understood 
from the, at the level of hyperbolic geometry because it's, it's related to the splitting of a manifold along essential analy. And this has been generalized by Bowditch for uh, word hyperbolic groups in general. And the decomposition on the limit set turns out to be exactly the same. Okay. And this is a way of cutting up the dynamics on the whole limit set to smaller pieces and then try to see what can happen on each piece. So this is JSJ decomposition of Bowditch. So what does it say? So uh, I will just give some uh, brief sketch of it. Uh, the main uh, feature of the, the decomposition is that your group G will act simplicially on a tree, T, with no edge inversions. and the finite quotients. Okay, so the tree will be simply short, of course. And um, so, so what sort of, so this just says that you have a splitting of your group. So what are the properties of this splitting? Is first, for each edge, The stabilizer of the edge is just virtually cyclic. And its limit set disconnects the whole limit set. Okay. So exactly like those two points, for instance, this could be an edge of the uh, a stabilizer of an edge. And the vertices are, uh, are uh, three types. One type is called elementary, meaning that it is as above. So uh, GV is uh, virtually cyclic. Then there is one type which is called a surface, surface type, which corresponds to I bundles of surfaces. Okay, so in this case, you have a canonical uh, cyclic order. So the group GV is uh, virtually free. And so the limit set is a Cantor set, but you have a canonical, comes with a canonical uh, uh, cyclic order on the points. So which means that it is naturally a Fuchsian group. Okay. And the last case is uh, what Bodish calls a rigid case, okay, rigid groups, meaning none of the above. Okay, so we understand essentially nothing. So in the context of hyperbolic three manifolds, these are, uh, this corresponds to a cylindric part manifold. And so uh, here, what we see is that at least when we cut the group into pieces, we understand fairly well the elementary piece because these are the cyclic ones. Those, I've already said that they look like Fuchsian groups. And then there's the last case of the rigid uh, vertices. And the key point here is that the dynamics is so complicated then that it cannot act in any way in the plane once you have this embedding. Okay, so the key point is that <coughs> if V is a rigid vertex, then the action of its stabilizer on its limit set is the restriction of an action of itself on the whole sphere. Okay, this topological case. And so then this means that I'm back to case one when I had a planar action. And so here, even though the limit set can be totally disconnected of it or uh, whatever the topology it is. It is always, always comes from a global action of the group. Okay, so let me just give, try to explain what's going on here. So you have your limit set, lambda v. And what you know is that attached to it, there are several 
you have the edges. Each edge of the tree comes, defines the cut points of the global group, of the global limit set. And so uh, you have some connected things which are glued to them, I guess, corresponding to edges. So here, since it's not a local cut point, it means that I have many little things going, coming out there. And so the basic idea that people do usually in three manifolds is that they have this manifold, they pinch the curves, and then they get a geometrically finite kind of group and work with this. And so here we can do exactly the same. So these components can be rather wild. And uh, so there are, uh, there are some sort of, okay. But they are nonetheless uh, arcwise connected. So I could replace each component by an arc and then pinch the arcs. And the decomposition of the sphere using these arcs is, is not very hard to prove that it has to be uh, it has to be uh, an upper semi-continuous decomposition of the sphere. And then you can shrink it little by little. And you can do it at the level of the Kleinian group K you started with if you want to get this uh, limit, the, the, to get the pinch model of, the, of your limit set. And in this case, uh, the topology of the limit set you obtain is well understood. It cannot, the boundary of the components cannot separate the limit set. And therefore, you have to have a, a planar action in this case. Once you have a planar action on the quotient, then you just lift it and check that you can do it consistently to get a, an action of the group uh, globally, okay? And so then here we can think that we're almost done because uh, we have our group, we cut it into several pieces and each piece, they are virtually Kleinian groups, okay? Because since this is Kleinian, the corollary is that GV is virtually a convex but of course, each piece is not really a Kleinian group. It's just virtually a Kleinian group. For instance, the edge groups, I don't know they are cyclic. They are just virtually cyclic. And so uh, there's one case where we can try to do that is if the, the <coughs> JSJ decomposition is nice. Nice in which sense? Well, uh, in the sense that, uh, well, there I go. I will be able to so now the idea is to try to use inductively the Klein Masquet theorems to glue together the Kleinian groups if they, if they are nice. Okay. So of course, very hard because I don't have any conformal structure to start with. But actually it's exactly what Thurston did when he proved his theorem on hypermobilization. So the easiest way for me to do the work is try to define a three manifold. Okay, so now I want to find some, some properties that I could add to the JSJ decomposition to make sure that I can build a mani three manifold to, to get a group to show that G will be the fundamental group of a uh, hyperbolic manifold and apply the theorem for Hagen manifolds. Okay. So uh, this is what I want to call a regular JSJ decomposition. So there are essentially two conditions that I want to ask. The first is that G is torsion free. So in this case, I will at least be closer to a fundamental group of a manifold. And also I won't have this problem of having virtually cyclic edges or uh, Z uh, elements. And the second condition is I had this action here. I did not know how to control the cyclic order. But since the limit set is locally connected, I know I have only finitely many components. So I would like the, the components to be fixed by the action of the elementary groups that appear under GSG decomposition. <coughs> so the action of elementary groups, uh, so which are cyclic now, acting on the connected components of the complement of their limit set is trivial. And so I claim that if I have this assumption, then I know how to build a manifold. And this is a well-known procedure. So the idea is the following. Uh, 
So each time you have an elementary group, I can see it as the fundamental group of a solid torus. Okay, and what I did not say is that in this uh, decompos decomposition of Bowditch, I know that there are only finitely edges attached to such a vertex here. And so to, for each of these edges, I will consider an annulus to define a, a gluing uh, annulus to glue it to the rest of the, to glue it uh, yeah, to the rest of the, the other pieces. Now, each time I see a surface uh, type uh, vertex, uh, I said it corresponded to, naturally, to a convex compact friction group. So these are, which are free. So it means that I have some holes in there. So they are finitely many. Okay, so what I look is, I define the I bundle. I just take the product with the interval, and then these holes define anuli also which I will use to glue, uh, the piece, uh, to glue with the rest of the pieces. And then you have the rigid type. So the rigid type, I don't know exactly how they look like, but I have some boundary components, so, uh, which are compact surfaces, uh, uh, which are uh, of genus at least two. And similarly, each edge, because of this property, of acting trivially on the limit set, I would know that they have to be primitive. There cannot be powers of, uh, of other luxodromic elements in the group. And also, because the action is planar, I know also that th they define hom homotopy, simple closed curves which are pair resistance uh, up to homotopy. So this defines a uh, pair pairing, of, of, uh, a pairing of, of the manifold. Okay, so then for each piece, I have a three manifold with anuli on them coming from the edges. And then I just glue the, each piece along the anuli uh, corresponding to the, the action of the, of the graph here, following the manual. And follows from the Bastard theory, uh, the topological point of view uh, of Scott and Wall, that what you get is a manifold with fundamental group, which is exactly G. So in this case, you can apply uh, Thurston's theorem to say that it has to be uh, a Kleinian group, okay? So in this case, I'm done. So of course, I made the strong assumptions to be torsion-free, and also uh, that the, the action here was fixing every component. Okay? So in general, it's not the case. Well, I don't know if it's the case or not. Actually, there are examples. I'll show one afterwards, I guess, if I have some time. I guess I will. Uh, that this really happens, even in the torsion-free case. And so what you want is that you want to get rid of the elements that bugs you, that bug you. For instance, the ones which change the cyclic order here, which make the things which do not, uh, uh, which do not fix the components one by one. And so the, the key property there is what uh, Jeremy Kahn explained yesterday, is the separability of subgroups. If I know that uh, the stabilizer of the components here is separable, then I can just forget about the other elements there. I have finitely many classes to get rid of, and I do it in a constant way, and then I, I get a finite index subgroup without these things. So the, what I'm saying is that to obtain to get a regular J is J decomposition. You just need to get the separability of elementary subgroups. Okay, and these are all quasi-convex subgroups. So it's exactly the property that uh, was mentioned yesterday, it's the Q-surf property. So the only way I know how to get the Q-surf property is to get a special action on the Q, cat zero Q complex. Okay. Or virtually special. Okay, 
Okay, so this is due to Hagelin and Weiss, right? And now, to get such an action, it follows from the work of Weiss that I just need to have a quasi-convex hierarchy. A virtual, which is the important part. This follows from. Virtual quasi convex hierarchy on G. So, what I claim is that we get it almost for free with all the work I've done. So, why is it the case? Well, first, you start with your group G. You look at the JSJ decomposition. This is already a quasi convex splitting of your group. Right? And each piece is either elementary, so it has a hierarchy. Either it is a function group, so also uh, I know that it has a, a hierarchy, or it is a convex or compact Lenin group. And here too, the work of Bergeron Wise and, uh, and, uh, and Egol, I guess, I think, uh, will prove that I have also a uh, quasi convex hierarchy for those elements. So then, put all together, I get a global hierarchy for my group, so I know that. The group acts virtually, especially on a, on a cat zero group complex. So I know that the, my elements are separable, and hence I can conclude that I can get a redeveloped GSG decomposition by taking a finite index subset. Okay. And so this ends the, the big sketch of the of the proof, right? So actually, the to prove just the rigidity, the quasi-isometric rigidity, I didn't need really to work with. Uh, with the planar actions, uh, there are different ways to go there using the hierarchy directly. But what I don't know how to do is to get rid of all this part of getting the separability. So let me just give an example which is due to Kapovich and Kleiner of a, of a group where it, you don't have a, something which is regular. So their construction is uh, rather simple. So you start with a torus with two holes. Okay, that you can, oops. I don't know if I cannot draw better than you. <laughs> and so one hole I label A and the other one B. And what, I, what they do is that they glue, they wrap around twice A around B. So they identify A squared to B. Okay. So this is an h &N extension of uh, of the free group of uh, rank three, right? And uh, what they prove is that uh, this cannot be the fundamental group of a, of a manifold, but it is virtually, um, it is virtually uh, convex or compact. So how does it go? Let, let's try to draw the, the limit set of this group. So G is uh, phi one of S, Amalgamated by identifying a square root of B. So I will start with a copy of the limit set of S. So I know it is a Fuchsian group. And I have two orbits of uh, jumps which come from both holes. Right? So one comes from A. And the other one, sorry, from B. Okay, so here I have two family of holes to get my, and my limit set is the complement. Okay. So I know that to each A bound uh, hole, I have to attach another copy of the limit set, along the, which comes from the blue hole, right? So here I have something. this, and it's attached to a blue thing, and then I have also other copies there. Let's see if I can. Okay. Uh, okay. Pretty poor. Okay, so what happens when uh, I make A act here? So it, it fixes this component, right? Because it's, uh, 
is how I define it. But it cannot fix that one because A does not belong to the edge right, with, with which I glued. It's the square. So it means that this component has to be mapped to something else. But it makes something like this, where I have another blue edge and other uh, holes somewhere. And when I act again with A, then I get A squared. And A squared is in the edge, so it has to fix that one. So the dynamics of A, it flips this component. And it does the same at every, at every hole. So each time you have a hole, uh, an orange hole, you have two blue things which are glued together. And the action just flips things around. Okay? So it's very far from being regular in the sense I've defined. And, uh, so what is not very difficult to prove is that this group is torsion-free because uh, if it had some uh, torsion, it should be in the fundamental group uh, in pi 1 or less, which is not the case. So. And uh, so here you need to apply this theorem to get rid of this. Oh, maybe I should say, what is the JSJ decomposition in this case? So this is not the JSJ decomposition, actually. Because here, what you want to do is uh, in the JSJ decomposition, you want to have a colored uh, tree, and you don't want pieces, vertices of the same type to be glued together. So the, the thing that, uh, that Bowditch does is to add a vertex, an elementary vertex, which corresponds to the, to the stabilizer of those two points. So you have a cyclic map gamma here. Here you have pi 1 of s. And then you have two edges, one which will identify a with gamma and B with uh, gamma squared, I guess. Uh, that's it, yes. Okay? So this is the, the graph that you obtain from Bowditch's uh, decomposition. And then the separability, what does it do for us? Well, it will get a, a finite covering of S. So you'll get a new group, pi of S prime. And then you will get a finite family of uh, cyclic groups. And for each group, you will have two blue edges attached like this. OK. And one orange for A. And then here you have this regular decomposition, and you can make the gluing as I explained before. In this case. So, in the five minutes that I have left, I would like to say that. Um, so, just what I first what I want us to stress here is that going to this finest index subgroup uh, might be uh, compulsory. I mean, you cannot just hope that it won't happen and that there will be a nice action. Here, really, there's something going on. And also, uh, one of my motivations to look at this problem is, uh, comes from a general conjecture about the characterization of Kleinian groups. So this conjecture is the following. We assume that G is a word hyperbolic group, and that this, its boundary is planar. And then you want to conclude that uh, that G is uh, virtually so up to finite index convex co-compact Kleinian group. So the way it's stated, it contains. Cannon's conjecture, when you assume that the boundary is the whole sphere. And it also contains uh, the so-called Kapovich-Kleiner conjecture. When a G, uh, the boundary is a serpent sea carpet. So of course, I did not define what is a word hyperbolic group. But one definition that you can take is the fact that your group acts on a comp metrivisible compact set as a uniform convergent action. Okay? And this is exactly equivalent. And the boundary would be that compact set on which it has this nice action. 
And so what this quasi-isometric rigidity tells us is that you start with a group. So this group carries a geometry which is given by the Kelly graph. And then either it looks like a piece of H3, and then you're OK, or it does not, and then there's no hope of getting a, a conclusion. So in some sense, quasi-isometric rigidity tells you that this conjecture is a well-posed problem. And there's a way of trying to find a solution. And so uh, the techniques that I have explained, even though they are more complicated than for the theorem that I proved, they can be used to get several characteriz characterizations of uh, convex compact canyon groups. So I will end up with this. So, uh, so the theorem is the following. I assume that uh, G is a word hyperbolic with a planar boundary and the following uh, equivalent. So G is a convex or compact linear group. The second, which is a little more general than what I've said, is that G embeds quasi-isometrically in H3. Another condition, which is equivalent to that one, is to say that the boundary with its conformal gauge embeds quasi-symmetrically or quasi-mobiously in uh, the Riemann sphere. Then you have a fourth condition, which is G acts on a cat zero cube complex. And uh, the last condition is more technical. It is uh, either the boundary is the whole sphere, and then you assume that the conformal dimension, the alpha regular conformal dimension of the boundary is attained. So this is work of uh, Bonk and Kleiner. Or uh, it is a, properly, a proper subset of the sphere, and then you assume that the conformal dimension, the alpha regular conformal dimension, is strictly less than 2. Okay? So the theorem is that all these conditions are equivalent, and the main ingredients are the ones that I have described for that. So here, uh, in fact, when you have this cube complex, then you have a hierarchy which comes for free coming from the spatial action. So then you just split your group, and then you rebuild the manifold little by little. Uh, these two conditions are slight generalizations of what I've explained when uh, you know actually that it comes from a limit set of a Kleinian group. But what you can prove is that if this happens, then the boundary has conformal dimensions strictly less than two, so you're okay. And, uh, in this setting here, the hard part is to rebuild the Riemann sphere and then show that you can extend the action exactly as uh, what I explained. But essentially, it's the same. Uh, okay, so I guess uh, I should stop now, and uh, I thank you for your attention.